Thank you, Mike. Thank you, brother. Go ahead and grab your Bible. We're going to go to Matthew chapter 28. If you're new to the Bible, Matthew is in the New Testament. Very first book in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, so Matthew chapter 28. There are a few passages in the Bible that are kind of like the greatest hits, right? The, the passages that everyone knows. Like, everyone knows the song, Staying Alive by the Bee Gees, right? Don't do the dance. But everyone knows the song, Staying Alive. But how many of you know the song, Living Eyes by the Bee Gees? Yeah, nobody, all right? And before you think I'm a big Bee Gees fan, I had to use Google, all right? I couldn't think of another Bee Gees song to save my life. But no one knows Living Eyes, right? That's what we call a deep cut, right? It's a song that only real Bee Gees fans, all two of them, know, right? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I should have said that. That's not in the sermon. Um, but there's only, you know, those are deep cuts that, 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 that only those people know. There are passages in the Bible that are like, uh, the greatest hits, the songs that, or the, the passages that everybody knows, like John three sixteen, for God so loved the world. You know that passage, right? Or Jeremiah twenty nine eleven, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, right? Or, or, or Philippians four thirteen, I can do all things through Him who gives me strength, right? Those are like the hits of the Bible. Those are the ones we always go back to. Another one is Matthew chapter twenty eight verse nineteen. Now you may know this as the Great Commission. Where Jesus says, therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right? That's what we're supposed to do uh, when we're Christians. That's what we're supposed to be about if we're a follower of Jesus. We're supposed to be all about making disciples, bringing people into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the name of the game that we're playing here. So most of us have heard that one before. But remember... I always say it's important for us to read the passages around the one that we're studying. So if you look at the verses right before that one, you'll see something pretty amazing. Look at Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 and 17. It says, Then the eleven disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him. But some of them doubted. Right? It was right after this that Jesus gave the Great Commission. And so what I want to focus on today is verse 17. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some of them, what? Doubted. They worshipped Jesus, but some of them doubted. And that's it, right? Matthew, for whatever reason, did not find it necessary to go into any further detail. And it bugs me to no end, right? Who doubted? Why did they doubt? What did they doubt? What happened to the doubters? There's just nothing there. It just says, and some doubted. Now, you might not think that's that big of a deal. But again, it's important for us to read the passages around the passage you're reading. And so it's also important for us to understand where it fits in to the greater narrative of the Bible. And so let's zoom out a little bit further. Look at the beginning of chapter 28. Your Bible probably has a heading at the first part of chapter 28. And if it does, it probably says something like, the resurrection, right? And so connect the dots with me. The disciples followed Jesus around for up to three years, listening to him preach and watching him perform miracles. They watch him get arrested and tortured. They watch as he's crucified and he's murdered. They, they, they watch as his body is put into a tomb. Verse 16 that we read said, Then the eleven disciples left for Galilee, going to where Jesus had told them to go. So track with me here. They saw Jesus die, then Jesus is raised from the dead, and the disciples encounter him on a road where Jesus tells them to go to a mountain in Galilee where he would meet them. Are you tracking with me? They saw him die, and then they met him after he died. They recognized him enough to obey him when he said, go to the mountain in Galilee, and they see him at the mountain in in Galilee, and Matthew tells us they worshipped him, but some of them doubted. How, right? How in the world are they doubting at this point? I mean, think about that for a second. How? Now, hear me. I'm actually not that interested in why they doubted. But I am interested in the fact that they, they doubted. See, they're standing in front of a man who had come back from the dead, yet they doubted. 
the people closest to Jesus doubt. I don't know who needs to hear this today, but if you have ever doubted anything about Jesus or the Bible, join the club. It's a very good club. I mean, see, even some of Jesus' closest buddies are in the club. If you have ever had questions about faith, questions about the Bible, questions about God, then this sermon is for you. I want to talk about doubt. But in reality, I want to talk about what we do with doubt. See, the first thing we need to understand, church, is that, 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 that the presence of doubt is not the absence of faith. Hear me. The presence of doubt is not the absence of faith. I've known many people who have felt so guilty because they've had moments of doubt or they, or they questioned God. Maybe you've been there. Maybe you're there right now. No matter how small the question or doubt might be or how large it might be, let me ask you, have you ever questioned God? I have. See, I'll be honest with you. I have. Several times in my life. I want you to hear me. As your pastor, the pastor of a church who believes in authenticity and no filters, I have questioned God. I have stood in a room, just me and God, and I have had it out with him. I have thrown everything at him that I could think of. Now, it doesn't have to be that profound in your own life. Maybe you're just kind of thinking about this whole Christianity thing that your spouse or your parents are trying to get you into, and maybe you're just not sure about it. It just doesn't seem like all of this can be real, right? A virgin birth, walking on water, the dead coming back to life. It all sounds good, but can we be real for a second? Come on, right? How does anyone believe this stuff? Are you there right now? Just, just own it, church. Admit it. Don't be ashamed of it. Don't, don't try to hide it. Parents, listen to me. I want you to encourage your kids to admit their doubts. Don't be afraid of their doubts. Doubt is not the enemy. Doubt is not what I worry about. The most damaging thing to your faith is not doubt, but unprocessed doubt. See, we cannot grow if we are unwilling to ask questions. Now, we know that when it comes to school, right? We know in school we're supposed to raise our hand and ask questions when we don't understand how to solve for X. When we start a new job, we, we will ask all types of questions. But when it comes to our faith, or the Bible, or God, or Jesus, or the Holy Spirit, we just keep all those questions to ourselves. Why? I mean, like, seriously, why? I think one reason is that people don't know they can have questions about faith or the Bible or the church. And I think the church <coughs> and pastors, and I know there's another pastor in this room who hopefully will back me up on this, I think the church and pastors have to accept some of the blame for that. See, I think church and pastors can be fearful people sometimes. We can fear people coming to us with questions about the Bible. Maybe you've been in a church like that. Maybe you've had a pastor like that. A place where you felt you, you never felt like you could go to your pastor and ask questions. Hear me, that says more about the church or the pastor than it does about you. The only reason I would ever be afraid of someone's question is if I was unsure of my own faith or I had something to hide. At church, I'm not hiding anything and I'm not unsure of my faith. I know Jesus. So ask away. Your unbelief will never, never tear down my belief. And so I invite the questions. Again, we believe in authenticity around here. You have questions, ask them. You have doubts, voice them. But I think the other reason we hesitate voicing our doubts is because we feel shame. Right? We feel like we're bad people if we doubt something we read in the Bible. We feel like bad people if we have some serious questions for God. We feel like bad people if we feel anger towards God. Let me ask you a question. How many of you have physically ever seen Jesus? No? Okay. How many of you physically walked the dirt roads of first century Israel with Jesus? How many of you were, were there when Jesus died? How many of you were there when he was buried? How many of you were there when he walked out of the tomb three days later? Anyone? 
Again, the disciples were. They experienced all of that. They saw all of it. And yet, some still doubted, even though Jesus was standing physically in front of them. If they doubt it, what makes you think you cannot? Why do you feel guilty about your doubts? Why do you feel bad about asking questions? Think for a second of the most famous doubter in the Bible. What's his name? Say his name. Thomas. Thomas. We literally call him Doubting Thomas, which is not cool. My middle name is Thomas, so I have a bit of a soft spot for my brother Thomas. Plus, my wife will tell you I'm a bit of a doubter myself. But I think Thomas gets a bad rap. Right? Thomas was actually someone of incredible faith. But to know that requires that you know Thomas' story. Thomas was a fisherman. Thomas was a complete nobody. In his culture, the rabbis would, would travel around the land looking for men to, to, make, them, to make their students or, or disciples, right? And they, so they would look for the guys who were educated. They would look for the elite. So not Thomas. And so it's pretty safe to say that, that no rabbi ever tried to recruit Thomas. He was a smelly fisherman, no education. But then came along this rabbi who seemed different. And this rabbi took an interest in Thomas. He invited Thomas to be one of his disciples. This, this rabbi was named Jesus. And Thomas was so overwhelmed by the offer and so convinced of who Jesus was that he left his job and became one of his, of his disciples. He gave away everything for Jesus. What you have to do to follow a rabbi. He believed with everything he had that Jesus was who he said he was. And then Jesus was killed and if you read the story, Thomas disappears. Thomas is nowhere to be found. For seven days after Jesus' resurrection, Thomas is missing in action. Now maybe, and this is purely conjecture on my part, you will not find this in the Bible, this is just conjecture. Maybe, just maybe, the reason Thomas was AWOL was because he was completely devastated by Jesus' death, maybe more than the other disciples. See, his world fell apart all around him. And then when the other disciples told him they had seen the Lord, he said something that would define him for every generation to come. You can find it in John chapter 20, verse 25. It says, they told him, we have seen the Lord. But Thomas replied, I won't believe it unless I can see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers into them, and place my hand into the wound in his side. Church, I think we have misunderstood what Thomas was saying. You see, this was a matter of life or death for Thomas. Because if it was true, it demanded the entirety of his life. See, he was not interested in playing church. Hear me, church. Thomas wasn't interested in just playing church. Why bother doing this whole worshiping thing if Jesus isn't really alive? That's what Thomas is talking about. So I want you to understand something this morning. There are three types of believers in the world. Casual, convenient, and committed. And each of us are one of those today. Casual, convenient, or committed. A casual believer is someone who says they believe in God, but that doesn't really uh, affect their daily lives. right? They don't, they don't let the teachings of Jesus impact their life. I mean, they're a good person, right? But that's about it. And then there are convenient Christians. And the sad part is there are a ton of convenient Christians in churches all across the U.S. today. Right? You're a believer when it's convenient. Mm -hmm. If it will help you close that deal, hey, let me tell you what my pastor said on Sunday. If it will help you land the date, hey, why don't you come to the church potluck with me? By the way, we have one on the 18th, so you can use that line uh, for that. <laughs> but you're a Christian when it's convenient for you. But you're not really interested in serving, right, in and through the church. You're not actually going to support the church financially unless it means you can buy a little favor with the pastor or the, the leaders, right? So you love church when it's convenient. You, you love Jesus when it's convenient for you, which, by the way, is not love, in case you're wondering. 
Try that with your spouse. But then there's the third category, the committed Christian. I think we should start calling that category a Thomas Christian. Because here's the thing. Thomas went on to be one of the great Christian leaders of his generation. How many of you knew that about Thomas? No, you know about his doubts. We all know about his doubts. But if Christian tradition is correct, Thomas was a rock star of a Christian. It's commonly accepted that between 52 AD and 72 AD, so-called doubting Thomas went to India and transformed that country in the name of Jesus. To this day, you can see things with Thomas's name on them in India. And it's believed that at some point one day, some unbelievers cornered him and told him that if he renounced his faith that, uh, in Jesus Christ, that they would not kill him. And it said that Thomas looked up to heaven and said, Never will I deny the one who died for me. And so the man tied him to a tree and drove a stake through his heart. Doubting Thomas? I don't think so. He was committed. What happened? How did he go from, I won't believe it until I see it, to staring death in the eye and refusing to renounce his faith? Church, he voiced his doubt. See, all of his friends were saying one thing. But he had the guts to say, you know what, I'm not so sure. Yeah, yeah, I hear what you're saying, and it sounds great. I gotta see it. I need to experience it. I need proof. He voiced his doubt. Even though he was physically talking to his disciples or to the disciples of Jesus, he was really talking to God. God, I need to see it. God, I need proof to know that Jesus is alive. I was a um, I was a dork when I was a kid. I know that shocks many of you, but I was a dork when I was a kid. Um, I was a dork who loved movies. All right, I love movies. And one of my favorite movies as a kid was Teen Wolf with Michael J. Fox. Any Teen Wolf fans? One, and he's the best one of you. Uh, <laughs> Teen Wolf. All right, love Teen Wolf. Uh, raise your hand if you've seen Teen Wolf. Okay, thankfully. And you don't like it? Oh, man. Okay, so I love Teen Wolf. And by the way, I have never shared this story publicly in my life, so please try not to laugh at me. But I remember one day as a kid, I was having a really bad day. Uh, just a poor me day. I felt like the world was against me. I felt like I didn't have any friends. I, I was just sad. Just really, really sad. If you're a parent, you know when your kids are just really sad, bummed out. And I remember what just decided I'm going to pray. Right? And I mean pray. I was pray. I don't mean like just some rote words. I mean I was, I was praying with, with everything that my little body could muster. And I had one request for God. God, if you love me, you will turn me into a werewolf. <laughs> if you've seen Teen Wolf, you understand because Teen Wolf was cool, right? He kicked butt on the basketball court. Girls loved him. Everybody wanted to be his friend. I know this sounds pitiful, but it's the truth. I pleaded with my God to prove that he was real by turning me into a werewolf. He did it. I'll just let this is not a werewolf. This is just a normal beard. He did not turn me into a, a werewolf. But the point is, so many of us have prayed the prayer, God, if you're real, do this or do that. God, if you're real, move this or move that. And when he doesn't turn you into a werewolf or doesn't move the picture on your bookshelf, you think, well, I guess he's not real. Years later, I was sitting in my bedroom in my apartment in Roswell talking to my dad on the phone. And I was lost. I felt completely alone. My life was completely completely broken. I was as low as I could imagine going. So I called my dad, who's a retired pastor. I remember my dad telling me, Jerry, close your eyes. And picture the most peaceful place you know. So I closed my eyes, and I immediately pictured a small waterfall up in Tiger, Georgia, on the grounds of a Christian retreat center. My dad said, Jerry, I want you to go there in your, in your mind's eye. And just picture yourself walking through the woods to the waterfall. He knew exactly where I was talking about. So I, I, I picture myself walking the trail down the little hill to the edge of the waterfall and sitting on a rock at the water's edge. My dad asked me to just describe what was around me. 
and I could see. If I describe everything I could see. He said, Jared, I want you to look over your right shoulder. And so I looked over my right shoulder in my mind's eye. I said, what do you see? And I said, I see Jesus. And what is Jesus doing? He's stretching out his hand. Jared, take his hand. I just reached up and I took his hand. that moment, I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that my Lord is real. Now hear me, church. I still had a very long way to go. I did not make a 180 degree turn that day. But I was on my way. He may have never turned me into a werewolf, but he showed up in that bedroom. You see, voicing our doubts, voicing our questions is the first step in going from a casual or convenient believer to a committed believer. See, Thomas voiced his doubts. Jesus, if you're real, I need to touch your wounds. Look back to John's gospel. John 20. Eight days later, the disciples were together again, and this time Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, and suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound of my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. Hear me, church. Jesus knew exactly what he was doing that day. Jesus knew who was in that room. It's not like Jesus walked into that room and was shocked when he saw Thomas. No, no, no. Jesus was showing up for doubting Thomas. And look at the first thing Jesus said. Jesus looked at doubting Thomas and said, Peace be with you. Thomas, the one who questioned my resurrection, peace be with you. Jesus did not rebuke him. Jesus did not belittle him. No, Jesus spoke peace over him. And so you, the one here today with all the doubts and all the questions, peace be with you. The one watching online right now with all the doubts and all the questions, so much so that you couldn't come to church today, peace be with you. Be with you. Amen. Jesus does not rebuke you. Jesus does not condemn you. Jesus says, seek, and you will find. Amen. Seek, and you will find. Hear me, church. Jesus is going to show up in your life. Jesus is going to reveal himself to you if you seek him. No, he may not move that picture on the wall. He may not turn you into a werewolf. Okay, he most definitely will not turn you into a werewolf. But I promise you, he will lead you into a season of discovery. Jesus showed up that day and said, Peace be with you. Put your finger uh, here and look at my hands. Put your hand into my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. Church, Jesus is going to show up in your life. The Holy Spirit is going to lead you into a season of discovery, but you have to keep seeking. You have to keep asking. Keep being honest about your questions and about your doubts. And one day he's going to show up. It might not be how you expect, right? The day he showed up for Thomas, he walked through a wall. I promise you, Thomas never saw that coming. But keep asking. Keep watching. Because he'll show up. Now the chances are pretty good you won't physically see him. But you might. My grandfather did. But he's going to show up. We are called to walk by faith. Not by sight. But I promise you he wants you to believe. He wants you to grow in your faith. He wants you to become a committed Christian. And so he's going to show up. And when he does, believe. Real quick, I want to look at a story from Mark chapter 9. I want to end with this. In the ninth chapter of the gospel, of his gospel, Mark tells us about a father who was desperate to find some healing for his son. His son was possessed by an evil spirit. And the man asked Jesus, Jesus' disciples, to heal the boy, but they couldn't, so they bring the boy to Jesus. And Jesus asked the father, how long has this been going on? And in verse 22, the dad said, since he was a little boy, 
The spirit often throws him into the fire, into the water, trying to kill him. Have mercy on us and help us if you can. If you can, have mercy on us. If you're real, move that book on that shelf. If you're real, turn me into a werewolf, right? Now look at Jesus' response in verse 23, Mark 9, 23. What do you mean if I can, Jesus asks. Anything is possible if a person believes. Now notice how the father replied in verse 24. The father instantly cried out, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. Help my unbelief. Church, you can't ask for help unless you're willing to admit you need help. You can't grow in your faith unless you're willing to admit there's room to grow in your faith. Jesus, help my unbelief is an acknowledgement that you have some unbelief or doubt and an acknowledgement that Jesus can take it away. Do you have doubts right now? Do you have questions right now? Name them. Stop running from them. It doesn't matter if anyone else shares your doubts or questions. It doesn't matter what anyone thinks about your doubts or your questions. Jesus has given you permission to ask, so ask. Seek. You will find the truth because he wants you to find the truth. No, it may not happen today. It may not happen tomorrow, but keep asking. Thomas had to wait eight days. You may have to wait longer, but hold on. He's coming, so hold on. Church, today, you need to confess your doubts. You need to confess your questions. So I want to give you an opportunity to do it. Tommy, if you'll come here for a second. If you'll pass these out for me. Make sure everyone gets one of those. Today, I want you to name your doubts. Today, I want you to name your questions. Jesus, why did my marriage end? Jesus, why was I mistreated as a child? This is the one I wrestled with. Jesus, why did my brother die? Jesus, why is there so much pain in the world? Jesus, do you really love me? Or maybe you just need to write, Jesus, I don't know if you're real. Whatever it is, I want you to write it down. It doesn't matter what it is, I want you to write it down. It doesn't matter how big or how small it is, I want you to write it down. No one has to see this. But you need to name it. You need to voice it. So I want you to take this home with you. And I, look, if you don't want to write it on this, that's fine. This is just a prompt for you to do it. Thank you, Tom. But I want you to name it. That's step one. Step two is to take it to Jesus every day in prayer, all day long. See, when you seek something in life, you don't stop. Right? Seeking is an active verb. It's something you do, and you don't stop until you find that which you're seeking. And so you name it, and then you seek after it. And so prayer is the required second step. You name it, and every day you say, Lord, I don't know if you're real. I need you to show me that you're real. Every day you wake up, Lord, I don't know if you're real. I need to know that you're real. Every single day you ask. And then maybe for some of you, you need to take another step. And that third step is reaching out to me. My contact info is on the card. I welcome your doubts. I welcome your questions. I will do everything I can to help you find an answer. I mean that. And if I can't, I will get you in touch with someone who can because we are called to be committed Christians. And we cannot get there unless we're willing to admit our doubts and our, our, our questions. So Lord, help my unbelief. Hear me, church. He wants to, and he will. Seek, and you will. Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you so very much that that day I stood in that empty classroom and had it out with you over the death of my brother and my grandfathers and my great-grandmother, all in about an 18-month time span. I was done with you. I didn't understand you. 
I didn't know how all that could happen to a family that was, was, was church going people. I thank you, Lord, that you stood there and you let me pound on your chest. some questions, Lord, we may never get answers to fully. But Lord, I know the answer that you love me is often enough. Lord, I thank you that you are bigger than all of our doubts, all of our questions. That you can take it all and that you welcome them all. So I don't know what the doubts are in this room. I, I, I don't know. But I know there are some. I know there are questions in this room. Maybe questions that we hadn't really thought about in a very long time, but maybe this message of the Holy Spirit has stirred them up again. Lord, let us see that as an invitation from you to deal with them so that we can grow in our faith. Lord, help us today not be afraid of asking difficult questions. Help us, the parents in this room, to not be afraid of our children asking difficult questions. Let us know today, Lord, as parents, it's okay for us to look at our kids and say, I don't know the answer to that. So let's call Pastor Jerry. Lord, give us the strength to keep seeking, keep asking every single day until we get that answer. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear when the answer is given. And then help us believe as Thomas believed. So Lord, we love you. And we thank you for loving us even though we have our doubts and we have our questions. But it's all in the name of Jesus.